Tonight on CFDK TV News, the airport near Terrace is set to get new asphalt. Metro Vancouver could have to pay a lot for a wastewater project. And people responsible for a major gold theft are facing charges. Northwest BC's only television news team. We are CFTK TV News. Good evening, I'm Cal Maslin and here's what's making the news in the Northwest and beyond for today. Residents of Prince Rupert can expect to soon see a lot of disruption to their daily lives as the city begins replacing their aging water pipe system. CFTK TV's Jaylene Matthews has the details. An aging, corroded pipe sits in Prince Rupert's council chambers, a stark reminder of the city's desperate need to replace the roughly 110-year-old water pipe system. We lose uh, roughly 40% of our water through all those little cracks and fissures that are currently existing every day. Prince Rupert Mayor Herb Pond says economic downturn in the city resulted in the pipes being left longer than they should have. If you kind of go through the era when we should have been or could have been replacing the pipes, um, things, things uh, in, in the 80s and the 90s were, were booming. And the thinking of that era was, well, when we need to replace pipes, we'll just replace the pipes. It won't be a problem for us. We have a lot of money coming. And then, of course, the pulp mill collapsed, the fishing industry collapsed. And right about the time where we should have really been serious about replacing pipes, we were completely without money. As a matter of fact, the conversation was, how do we keep ourselves from going bankrupt? Um, and, and so... It's it just a, an unfortunate series of timing circumstances. Mayor Pond says that once the roughly $200 million provincially and federally funded project is complete, it will have a 100-year life expectancy. But in the meantime, expect life to get messy. You know, digging up a third of your water pipes, a third, uh, that means entire blocks are going to be dug up at once, right? Because it means that... Um, if your block gets torn up, you're not going to be able to drive to your house. You're not going to be able to carry the groceries from your carport into your house. You're going to have to walk some distance. We're going to have to run a temporary water line above ground to each house. That'll probably mean more boil water advisories while we're in that state. Um, the, the route that you took to work last week or to school might not be the route you're taking to, to work the next week or the week after that. Um, and, and so it will be incredibly disruptive. But Mayor Pond says the destruction also comes with opportunity. We've got to replace the pipes anyway. We're going to be in there anyway. So how can we uh, improve the streetscape so that it, it slows traffic down, so that it feels more like you're in, a, in the downtown of a city rather than on a four-lane highway, right? Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think people will be really pleased with where we end up. It's not going to be pretty getting from here to there. Work is expected to be completed within a three-year time frame. For CFTK TV News in Prince Rupert, I'm Jaylene Matthews. The BC provincial government is sending $2 million the way of the Northwest Regional Airport so that it can do some renovation work. The grant is said to be going towards a major construction project where the asphalt on their runway is going to be taken out and replaced. However, the grant only covers part of the project as it costs about $5 million in total, in part because of the major infrastructure work that will accompany the project, and the airport will pay off the remaining $3 million with money in a reserve account. And as for the asphalt, 157,000 square feet of it is said to be replaced about four inches deep in the ground, and it is currently expected that it will end up fully installed before this year comes to an end. The District of Kinemet is taking steps to attract and retain healthcare professionals. The Kinemet Healthcare Professionals Attraction and Retention Strategy has been adopted with some key recommendations to boost the number of healthcare professionals in the city. The strategy is funded by LNG Canada. The first year of the program will include hiring of a dedicated attraction and retention coordinator, financial incentives for recruitment, and training will be offered alongside housing and transportation allowances. The district has also approved a bursary for students in Kinemet schools pursuing a career in healthcare. 
The $5,000 bursary will be awarded to two successful eligible students who indicate a willingness to return to Kitimat for work once they complete their schooling. The full strategy document is available to read at the District of Kitimat's website, www.kitimat.ca reports. Prince Rupert residents can now retrofit their homes with a heat pump system thanks to Ecotrust Canada's new no-cost service. According to Ecotrust, the new service addresses issues of high heating costs, discomfort and energy inefficiency in homes throughout the region. Households will receive personalized guidance throughout the renovation journey. Prince Rupert Mayor Herb Pond said the city is proud to partner with Ecotrust as the Home Energy Retrofit Feasibility Study was completed last year. He went on to say that they're excited to see that there is more coming out of that work to support Rupert residents and save money and emissions through these retrofits. Residents can sign up for the program at Ecotrust's website. Coming up next is a look at a hearing for a father who killed his children. Welcome back. It was a horrific act that shocked a community in the country. Three children in Merritt stabbed to death by their father, Alan Schoenborn, back in 2008. He's been a patient at a psychiatric hospital ever since he was found not criminally responsible for their murders. Now he's reportedly legally changed his name as the BC Review Board decides whether to grant him more freedom. CTV St. John Alexander has more. At first, Alan Schoenborn sat quietly, his head bowed, seemingly listening attentively. Only on occasion were there small outbursts. Exemplary, he said, when the board asked doctors about his behavior. But Crown lawyers argued he should not be released, saying Schoenborn remains a significant threat to the safety of the public. His lawyer, Rishi Gill, agreed, but got into tense exchanges with the review board, at one point becoming so frustrated he walked out. We didn't feel it was appropriate to continue to deal with this particular board at this time. It does not help matters to um, be subjected to some of the things that were happening in that room today. In 2008, Schoenborn stabbed and smothered his own children, Caitlin, Max and Corden. Their mother, Darcy Clark, passed away in 2019. It's pretty hard on me. I think about it every other day, about where would my children be today, or where would my sister's children be today? What kind of a parent would they be? What kind of schooling would they be? Uh, you know, they would all be young adults now. Earlier, Schoenborn, who was often allowed brief leave, became agitated when the board asked about the risk he might pose to children. This is BS, he yelled. If a child's on a train, I have to get off? All three guards got on their feet ready to intervene if they had to. Nobody is ever going to um, get over the horror of what happened in the past. And I will say I've been involved in this case from the get-go. Schoenborn has also legally changed his name and is fighting to keep that new name away from the public. Sinjin Alexander, CTV News, Coquitlam. It was an emotional day at the start of a coroner's inquest into a deadly hostage-taking situation in Surrey. The case dates back to 2019 when a woman was killed by stray bullets fired by police while she was being held captive by her boyfriend. Then the jury heard from the victim's son. CTV's Yasmin Gandam has more. Family and people closest to Nona McEwen and Randy Crossan spoke about the couple's tumultuous relationship and the hostage taking that eventually led to both of their deaths. Four witnesses were called to the stand, including McEwen's son, Brandon, and Crossan's probation officer. The two were killed in March 2019 after Crossan locked McEwen, his girlfriend at the time, in the home in Surrey and held her at gunpoint. A 10-hour standoff ended when RCMP officers officers fired their weapons. Police fatally shot Crossan, but in the process also shot and killed McEwen. BC's police watchdog cleared the officers and concluded the woman's death was an accident. Crossan's parole officer told the coroner and jury that his criminal history began in 1996 and he had been convicted for assaulting McEwen before. McEwen's son, Brandon, who called police when she was locked inside the house, tearfully remembered his mother. He says having to tell Crossan and McEwen's daughter that both her parents were gone was the hardest thing he has had to do. He told the jury that Crossan had been in a fight with his father and was told to leave the property. He described disappointment that RCMP were found blameless in the death. 
The goal is to understand what led to this fatal incident and what changes, if any, can be made to prevent further situations like this from happening. Nearly 30 witnesses are expected to testify in the inquest, and it is expected to wrap next week. Yasmin Gandem, CTV News, Burnaby. Metro Vancouverites could be on the hook for a costly wastewater project in North Vancouver. The issue is that more than $3 billion budgets and whether the cost should be shared by taxpayers who do not live on the North Shore. CTV's Isabella Zavarisi has more. I've got a wastewater treatment plant. I've got a solid waste uh, facility. Lots of you have none of those, or one of those, or two of those, but I think we're the only one that has all of it. District of North Vancouver Mayor Mike Little making a case for why his municipality shouldn't bear the brunt of an expensive project. The latest budget increase for a wastewater plant on the North Shore is coming in at $3.86 billion, putting households on the hook for $725 every year for the next three decades. The mayor looking to other municipalities for financial aid. It's not really fair for the North Shore municipalities to carry such a heavy load and we're, we're asking for help from, uh, from our neighbours to be able to, uh, to carry that. At today's Metro Vancouver Budget Workshop, board members discussed how costs will be distributed for the project. Will North Shore taxpayers have to pay for it all or is splitting the bill amongst the region a better option? If the amount is split, households across Metro Vancouver would see about a $140 annual bill. One Vancouver City Councillor says she's all for a more equitable outcome. Now, is it fair to burden those people on the North Shore with really big rate increases um, or should we each take a little bit of an increase and make it fair for them. Another option is to front load or pay costs up front, a move that taxpayers would feel instantly. My recommendation is the front end loading only would work if there's a wider distribution. Little says it's a frustrating position to be in financially, figuring out how to disperse these financial dues on different municipalities and ratepayers. There's no question when you see these kinds of cost escalations, uh, they're uh, getting people quite nervous about what bills are coming down the road towards us. Turning to tonight's weather, the north coast is said to be all clear with their low at 6 degrees. The Terrace Kitimat area will also be similarly clear but have a different high at 3 degrees. And the Bulkley Valley and Lakes District is likely to have similar clear conditions but a colder low of minus 9 degrees. On the north coast, the week for them should consist of mixed conditions of sun, clouds and rain, while their high moves between 9 and 15 degrees. In the Terrace Kitimat area, their next week or so will go back and forth between sunny days, partly cloudy days, and rainy days, with the high shifting from 14 to 17 degrees. And in the Bulkley Valley and Lakes District, the upcoming week will contain days that are mostly sunny, but with a few clouds mixed in as well, and the high bouncing around from 9 to 15 degrees. Checking out the highways now, visit Drive BC for the latest and up-to-date conditions, and as always, drive safe out there. On Highway 16, there is utility work, various bits of maintenance, road sweeping, construction work, plus the Usk Ferry is out of service and the cable car is in effect. Highway 37 has some limited visibility, while also having roadside brushing, road sweeping, and frost heaves and the Telegraph Creek Road has muddy sections and frost heaves. And this is what the roads were looking like this afternoon around the region from the view of the province's highway cabs. Still to come is a profile of a prison with some less than ideal conditions. Welcome back. Now to an exclusive on how conditions are so bad at a maximum security jail in Toronto that it has judges calling for action. 
CTV's John Woodward has more. The lockout is horrible. That's the voice of Daylo Robinson calling from custody. He's awaiting trial on human trafficking charges. In an interview, he described the effect of continuous lockdowns at Toronto South Detention Centre on his fellow inmates. I've seen it slowly take away any type of humanity a person has and it turns them into the animal. Those conditions were repeatedly panned by judges this year and last who slammed continuous and frequent lockdowns, cells infested with ants, cockroaches and spiders, and an infestation of mice as well as silverfish. A review by CTV News of court judgment shows at least two dozen convicts had their sentences reduced last year with judges unimpressed at conditions at Toronto South. These conditions are not humane, wrote Justice Anne Malloy in a decision in March. If the Canadian public heard that one of our citizens was being held in similar conditions in a foreign prison, especially while presumed innocent of any charges against them, they would be outraged, as they should be. And yet these dehumanizing conditions have continued unchecked and unimproved. In a case last week, Justice Brock Jones of the Ontario Court of Justice said those who suffer the greatest are often our most vulnerable citizens. The poor, socially disadvantaged, those with mental health challenges, Indigenous Canadians and racialized Canadians. It long ago reached a crisis level. Something must change and it must begin to change now. A sentiment rejected by Ontario's Attorney General in January. These are conditions that I think should embarrass us. But observers warn the conditions will continue to impact cases and reduce sentences, making it much harder for the government to be tough on crime. They're locked uh, in a tiny space with two other people with no fresh air and no access to a phone for days and days on end. People's human rights are being violated in Ontario prisons. Robinson has filed suit saying the conditions affected his medical care, claiming he was injected by a jail nurse who used a dirty needle. It was only after that incident that he was able to get out. He's now awaiting trial in Toronto East Detention Centre. John Woodward, CTV News. It has now been more than one year since the largest gold theft in Canadian history. It happened at Toronto's Pearson Airport, and police have since revealed that nine people are now facing charges. And as CTV's Raheem Ladani explains, the suspects include a former and current airline employee. What are we stealing? While it may sound like a Hollywood blockbuster movie, the largest gold heist in Canadian history was anything but fiction. And we now know the starring suspects are all from the greater Toronto area. This one is a carefully planned and well-organized group of criminals from both inside and outside of airport facilities that orchestrated this theft. Police say it started when this man, 25-year-old Durante King McLean of Brampton, showed up to the Air Canada cargo warehouse at Toronto's Pearson International Airport on April 17, 2023. He presented this airway bill, which was actually for a shipment of seafood that was picked up the day before the heist. But a duplicate copy was printed inside the airport by an employee. A short time later, a forklift arrived with a container of gold and foreign currency and loaded it into the rear of the suspect's truck. More than four months after the heist, police got a break. South of the border, King McLean was pulled over by a state trooper in Pennsylvania for a minor traffic violation. That's when they discovered 65 stolen and automatic guns. Police in Peel Region believe those guns were bought with profit from the gold heist. Their investigation also leading to the recovery of the white truck, more than $400,000, six pure gold bracelets and tools commonly used to melt gold. While King McLean is in U.S. police custody on firearms trafficking charges, Peel Police have arrested these five men, one, an Air Canada employee, another, a jewelry store owner. They've also issued Canada-wide warrants for three other men, including a former Air Canada employee. But these criminals thought they were more sophisticated than police. They were wrong. To date, still only a fraction of the $20 million worth of stolen gold has been recovered. And police admit they likely won't find it all. We believe the gold has been melted down and reconstituted into local and possibly international markets. Uh, it can be done, unfortunately, fairly easy. And that's what we're trying to find out. Adding their investigation is far from complete. Raheem Ladani, CTV News, Brampton. And now we turn our attention to the stock markets. 
The Canadian dollar is up 15 tenths of a cent, the price of gold is up $9.60, oil is up 4 cents, natural gas is up 5 cents, aluminum is up $25.50. In Toronto, the TSX is up 52.39 points, the Venture Index is down 0.95. In New York, the Dow Jones is up 22.07, and NASDAQ is down 81.87. Still ahead, a Raptors player has been permanently banned from the NBA. Welcome back. A rare lifetime ban from the NBA has been handed down to former Toronto Raptors forward John Tate Porter. The league found he violated its rules by betting on games, passing on information to gamblers, and even claiming illness to influence a wager. CTV's Mike Walker has more. This is winning time. John Tay Porter's NBA career is over. The Raptors' backup center banned for life following a probe into gambling allegations. We don't want this for our league. Raptors president Masai Ujiri spoke about the NBA's investigation shortly before the ban was issued. My first reaction is obviously a surprise. The league launched the investigation after suspicious bets were brought to its attention by licensed sports betting operators and an organization that monitors legal betting markets. The investigation found that Porter disclosed information about his own health to a sports better ahead of the Raptors' March 20th game against Sacramento. It also found that he limited his performance in one or more games for sport betting purposes and that Porter placed at least 13 bets on NBA games between January and March through an associate's online account. The payout for those games was more than $76,000, with net winnings of nearly $22,000. It's more transparent, so you can catch these players. This sports legal analyst says Porter's actions undermine the entire integrity of the game. Why do we go to games? Because the outcome is not predetermined or fixed. NBA Commissioner Adam Silver said in a statement, there is nothing more important than protecting the integrity of NBA competition for our fans, our teams, and everyone associated with our sport, which is why John Tay Porter's blatant violation of our gaming rules are being met with the most severe punishment. The league says Porter never placed bets on games he played in. TSN's Josh Lewenberg believes this will impact the player vetting process by teams. This is just another layer of things to look for because again, this isn't going away. This is maybe the first incident. The Raptors standing by their vetting of Porter. From all the reports and everything um, uh, we had, I think um, this was um, nothing we, um, we could know about. Police in Prince George say fraudsters are posing as Northern Health employees and going door to door. RCMP say they're investigating reports of people claiming to be Northern Health or FireSmart employees two weeks after the Health Authority warned the public about fraudulent phone calls, promising prizes, or a free home safety inspection. Mounties say people should open their homes to strangers, even if they present credentials and urge people to call organizations to confirm the legitimacy of any solicitors that show up on their doorsteps. Police say they're still looking for the people posing as Northern Health employees and say that anyone approached by people claiming to be from the authority should contact the Prince George RCMP. That's all our news for now. From everyone at CFDK TV News, I'm Kale Maslin and thanks for watching.